I tell people to treat work as if it's your in-laws in your house. So would you invite your in-laws if they were staying with you? Would you invite them into your bed at 6 (laughs) a.m.? No. Would you hang out with them all the way until the absolute last minute before you go to sleep? No. Would you be talking to them constantly throughout the day, the whole time, every time you're eating, you know? No. This is kind of the mind flip that you begin this project with, Laura, which is you begin by talking about how I I think it's a weekend and you're sitting on the sofa and you like binge watch, I think all of Heartland in one one day. (laughs) I love Heartland. (laughs) And and everybody's like, this is so nonproductive. And you're like, no, 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 this is incredibly productive. Talk about this mind shift and productivity through Heartland. Yeah. So when I do a speaking event, I start by saying, you know, close your eyes, think of your most productive day ever. And then I say, raise your hand if it was a day where you were binge watching TV the entire day. And of course, no one raises their hand. But my argument is that if your intention was to relax and watch your favorite show, you set aside the time to do it and you executed and you felt like at the end of it that you did it well and it achieved its goal of relaxing you and entertaining you then that was a productive day. So I think people think of this churn as productive, but that doesn't always mean we're doing the right things. And so, you know, I like to think of productivity more like intention. What are you intending to do? And then did you do it well? You focus first on these five C's of, of productivity. And I'd like to just bring each of these up and, and can you kind of give us some context around them? So, so you start with calm. Mm-hmm. Why do we start there? Because I think with the, you know, busy is not important, which we kind of touched on when you're filling your time so much, you don't realize the value of that downtime of the calm time. So again, if I'm doing a speaking event and I say, when do you, where do you think of your best ideas? You know, answers are in the shower, in a commute, um, on a walk with the dog. Answers are never in my 10th meeting of the day, uh, you know, knee deep in my email, you know, so I think when we think about calm, that's actually when a lot of the creativity happens. It's when we decompress. I talk about thinking of it like batch brew coffee. You're letting it drip through. So that's really rich, really bold ideas that are coming out of it. So you want to start with that calm, those down times, those moments of, you know, non-active brain moments. And then that's when you actually are going to spark a new idea, which leads to the next C. That You know, people think productivity means I shove more in, which we already talked about a little bit, but to, but to truly be productive, there has to be just this, a little more time between signal and response. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like you give yourself time to make the right decision about, is this actually important? When do I do it? Which list does it go on? And we'll get to some of that for all of our stackers. But I feel like that calm is to create this just a little bit more space so I can make better decisions. Is that true? Yes. Cause I think we're constantly like on, 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 on. And I talk about it like walkie talkies. If you're in the email, in the, in the meeting, in the, you know, talking, talking, solving, 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 that's you holding your button on the walkie talkie. But the other end is those ideas and creativity. But if you never take your hand off the button, you can never hear those other things that are coming in those reflections of maybe I shouldn't be spending so much time on this, or that's actually a good idea. I should expand some more time on this. So I just had a friend, she told me that she had meetings all day And it was four o'clock and she kind of wanted to do some stuff, but she felt like she was exhausted. So her kids were coming home at five and she said, I just laid on the couch, literally stared into space for like 45 minutes. And the funny thing is, is that was probably more productive than her six hours previously worth of meetings because she was taking in all that information. She just had that time to say, oh, you know what? Something happened in that second meeting I didn't actually take time to reflect on. And now I have a little action item I want to do later on. And so, you know, we we don't think of that as productive. We kind of think, oh, I should just take that hour to send a little more emails where it's like, no, that was probably the best thing she could have done. The second one of your C's then is create. Mm -hmm. So again, when you have those calm moments, when do you think of your best ideas? You know, you have that walk with your dog, you have that workout, you have that meditation, you have that, you know, whatever that downtime is for you. That's when you do come up with your ideas. So you say, oh, I've been meaning to do this or you know what I should do? I should ask this person to do this or I should do this for my client or whatever it is. It it comes to you. It's that inspiration because you've let your brain rest. It's that really rich, rich coffee that's now dripped through the batch brew and you have those ideas. So the, you know, some of the times the best thing you can do is have those calm moments if you need to be more creative, need to think bigger picture, need to have more vision for your organization, whatever that is, the, the calm moves to the create. 
That's that's fabulous. And you're right. It's always on my morning run Mm -hmm. in the shower, in these calm periods when I get my best ideas. It's never in the fifth meeting of the day, to your point. (laughs) Third, third then is to capture them. This is the frustrating thing. I remember this is how bad I am at this, Laura. I had this awesome idea for, uh, for, for an Instagram reel, just a fantastic idea. This is six months ago and it still drives me crazy. And I captured it and I put Taco Bell idea. And I remember it was something funny about Taco Bell, about like fourth meal and comparing it to financial planning. I remember it was hilarious. I don't remember what was funny about it. I didn't capture enough of it to make it (gasps) actionable. And now I'm pissed (laughs) that I have no idea what the Taco Bell idea was. In fact, I told this woman on our team, Tina, about it. She doesn't remember because neither of us (sighs) captured it. So (laughs) how do we how do we grab it more than just Taco Bell idea? You know, when you have those good ideas, the main thing is. I have a system where I can capture the idea in the right way so that when I get back into my workflow, I know what it was and how to execute because an idea that comes to you is only as good as what you do with it after that. Yeah. When um, you, you have a good capture system. So I use voiceless. So I'm on a run. You know, I can tell my wearable device, okay, add this to my list. And I use my voice to create an audio note of what I'm thinking. Or when I'm in the kitchen and my hands are totally covered in my last egg, I can say, hey, you know, to my Google Nest device, add, add eggs to my grocery list. So it has to be available anytime. It can't be like one piece of paper that's on your desk at work. It has to be something where you can constantly funnel in the things that you're thinking of. No need to kind of organize them at that point. This is just to get them out of your head in a way that you can understand. So I do that sometimes where I say, add cheese to my grocery list. I ask myself like, what type of cheese was I even talking about? So I've learned over time to get more and more specific. Like what is future me going to need to see on that list in order to remember what to buy? So I think you get better over time with how you're classifying your ideas. I I, I love that. And I watched a, a pretty badass video of yours too, where you talked about uh, not just the grocery list, but now with technology, and I think a lot of our stackers don't know this, you can put a, a, a I'm going to use the wrong terminology, but, but a tag so that it reminds you at the grocery store to get more, more eggs. Like, how do I, how do I do that in Google? Yeah. So within Google keep, which is where I, that's where I use my voice to add to those lists. So I say, okay, add this to the grocery list. And then I have a little setting under that note where you click the three dots, you can say, pop this list up on my phone when I hit and then you put in the GPS location. So when I get to the grocery store, that pops up. I even just did, um, I had some ideas of what I wanted to give my kids in their Easter baskets this year. I had that idea last year. I made a Google Keep note of it. I set it to pop back up onto my phone a month before Easter this year. I actually surprised myself. I was like, wow, that was really cool. I'm so impressed with myself because now I have all these ideas and I did it, you know, exactly when I was sitting there thinking, what should I get for Easter baskets this year? So, you know, there's a lot of customization too. You got to know your tools, let them work for you. And so within Google Keep, you know, I've messed with the settings and said like, how can I make this a power tool, make it work for me? And that's one of the examples. You started this off with Calm. And I feel like that calms my brain down because my brain consistently, and I think this is an analogy from you know David Allen's uh, uh, book where he's like, my brain reminds me that I need milk on my run when I generally think I can do nothing about that, you know? Yes. And so my brain calms down once I put it there and I know I'll be notified at the grocery store when I need to know that I need milk. Exactly. And then it leaves so much more room in your brain. So it's like all the things that are coming to you, like I need to get that birthday party gift. I need to send that email for work. I need to buy that at the groceries or I need batteries, you know? So it's like, if you're not doing anything with that, that's just so much mental noise. And that's where people get bogged down in the mental load because it's like, I see this, I see this, I get this email. I have all these things I need to do and I just feel overwhelmed. And so that's where I really go into like a a true system that your brain can trust because that's what gets that out of, out of your brain. And it leaves room for more good ideas. I feel like a lot of us let our technology control us instead of us controlling our technology. And, um, and, you know, I I know people that, that um, check their email consistently throughout the day, about 50 times a day. I feel I have a friend that during a conversation, Laura, he will, every time his, his watch gives him a new notification he will look down the middle of a cut. There's nothing more annoying, by the way. If, if, if you're one of these people, there's nothing more annoying <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and there's, you. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's nothing that tells me that I'm not important to you. Right. Like you consistently looking at your watch in the middle of my fascinating story. Right? Yes. <laughs> uh, how do we, how do we attack email? Maybe, maybe let's just start with that one. Cause I think you've got a great analogy for email about how we attack email to maybe take this thing we think is urgent and put it back in its place. Yes. So the first thing I would say is I tell people to treat work as if it's your in-laws in your house. So would you invite your in-laws if they were staying with you? <laughs> would you invite them into your bed at 6 a.m.? No. Would you hang out with them all the way until the absolute last minute before you go to sleep? No. Would you be talking to them constantly throughout the day, the whole time, every time you're eating? You know, no, you would get space from them. I love my in-laws. I, I happen to love them. But if you have work constantly, your email, you wake up, it's the first thing you do. Go to bed, it's the last thing you do. You're checking it hundreds of times when there's nothing. It's kind of that video game dopamine mentality where yeah. we like to just see and see. But if you're not planning on addressing it, you know, you can keep an eye on it and you can customize your technology. Like I get updates just from a specific subset of my email. So if my manager emails me directly or certain individuals that I know I want to see, that's what shows up on my phone. Again, customizing your tools, but I don't see everything. So that per your friend should do that with, with their watch because there are some situations with, you know, kids in school, you might want to get the call, but that's not everything. So you got to take that time. But secondly, I think when we think about email, you know, the first thing I do with people is get out whatever they don't need to see. I, I set an egg timer for 20 minutes and we just play a video game style. Let's just look for things that we can search for the word unsubscribe. That's typically the fastest way of seeing things that are not sent directly to you because they all have the word unsubscribe. So that's an easy way, just starting to create filters, rules, get the stuff out. The second piece, the second step is getting things that you need to see important. So if my manager emails me directly, that should look different than him emailing the entire org. Because if I'm in a meeting or something, I want to see that. I want to be able to open it right away. If I have important clients because I'm in sales, their email should look different in my inbox. And so you want to set those, those rules up one time to say, if it's from them to me, I need it to stick out. So that way it's not just all unread or bold. The third piece, which I go really in depth in the book, in the, in the email chapter is thinking of your email like laundry. I love this analogy. When you've talked about it like laundry, I'm like, oh my God, I do. I do not do this, which is your analogy is I, I fold one piece of laundry. I take it to the closet. Then I walk all the way back. Then I fold another piece and then I take it to the, like, nobody d does that. Exactly. So if you, if I told you this is how you're doing your laundry, oh, then you, then you take out one sock. You don't feel like finding the other sock. So you put it away. You find, this is my favorite. You find a pair of wet pants. You say, uh, I don't want to deal with this. So I'm going to throw it back in with the dry clothes. That's what you do when you mark something as unread when you've already seen it. You're telling yourself, I'm going to throw it back in there. Then two seconds later, you grab the same pair of pants. You're like, wait a second. I already touched that. Think of how much energy that's being wasted there. And so I feel like if you, if you think about your laundry, you know, you take everything out, you put it into piles based on what you need to do, fold, hang and and match your socks. You don't I, I don't call inbox zero, meaning that you've answered every email. No, it means everything's in piles and you've set your future self up what to do with those piles. And so you know where that pink shirt is because you know what? You touched it once. It's in the fold pile. You haven't gotten to it yet. Then you take the time to fold, 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 fold. You find, you know, obviously efficiencies in folding all at one time. And then you take one pile and walk it up to your dresser. And so when you think of your email, you should have the read basket, review, respond. And then those should be the things that you're respond, respond, respond all at once. You're not you're not taking one item here and there. And what people, most people do, they open their dryer 50 times throughout the day to tell themselves, oh my gosh, I just have so many clothes that I haven't dealt with. And then at the end of the night, they turn it back on with wet clothes and they're like, I'll deal with it tomorrow. That is so true. <laughs> you have a list system. And I just want to go briefly into this because a lot of us have lists. We have inefficient lists. You have a list funnel. Can you walk through how your list funnel works? I've been using this system and the idea of it is that lists are great, but how do they interact? How do they work with deadlines? If you have, like, I just thought of something in my head that I wanted to do in the school year starting in the fall. So it's like, am I going to put that on my list of things that I wanted to do today? You know, that's not, that doesn't make sense that, so you can't really just have one list. And so 
it, uh, it's hard to describe, I think, verbally. So I have all these templates on my website, but you start with what I call like a dashboard list, a main list. It has everything that you could and want to do in your life into categories. It feels like, it feels like Laura, like kind of just a puke it out list. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like everything I've been meaning to learn piano. I also need to do this next week. You know, it's just, and the reason it's put into categories is because it's the type of action. So I had, um, you know, all the calls I need to make, that's one section of it. And the other day I got somewhere early. I pulled up that on my phone and said, Oh, here are the three calls. I got 15 minutes. I'll start going through them. Or you have things that are, you know, on the computer. So if you have a few extra minutes, you can go to the computer list and find it. So you start with that, but you don't want to look at that list all the time because how stressful for me to constantly be looking at things that I need to do in the fall. You know, that's not helpful for my brain to see those things constantly. So what you do is you take that top of the funnel, that main list, and you start funneling down. Each Sunday, you say, all right, these are the things that I realistically can accomplish from this list this week. It also helps you see those the things with deadlines. Like I have something coming up in two months. I'm going to see it each Sunday at the beginning of the week. It's never going to get ahead of me. I'm never going to say, oh gosh, I forgot. No, every Sunday I'm going to see it. And I'm going to ask myself, is this the time where I need to start prepping for it? From there, you actually create a daily list each day. So you have your things that you hope to accomplish this week. And then the night before you say, here is what I accomplish the next day. So I think one of the downfalls of productivity is having all these things we want to do. And sometimes I'll, I'll do this in my coaching sessions. I'll say, show me your to-do list. And then I'll point to them and say, okay, when do you plan to do that? And when do you plan to do that? And the answer is a lot of the times, oh, I don't know when I get to it, which ends up being at night. And so you want to actually treat those items like scheduling. You want to say, okay, I have to do this. It's going to take an hour and I'm going to do it from 10 to 11 tomorrow. And that means you're so much more likely to do that. And at 10 a.m., you don't have to decide, oh, what should I do? Let me go back to my giant list of things that I need you know, in the fall. So it's a really focused way of making sure that everything you have to do stays in this ironclad closed system so your brain knows exactly what it needs to do and what it doesn't need to do, which is equally as important. And that is the beginning uh, stackers of the last two on the list, which is consolidating and closing loops. And then mm -hmm. that leads us to more calm and then back into the, back into the cycle exactly. again. Laura, thank you so much for joining thank us you. and helping make us more productive. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.